Greetings, everyone. We're coming you, to you today to discuss the issue of blood clots, especially with relationship to the vaccines. There's been a lot in the press about this and a lot of information, and we'd like to uh, provide a little bit clarification today. And uh, we have uh, uh, with us uh, Professor Prodan from the University of Oklahoma, who's a neurologist and an expert uh, on this subject, particularly the cerebral blood clots, which we've been hearing about, and Dr. Hassan Sadaldin, who represents the younger physician in training that is also uh, Im important to understand where they're coming from with regard to this disease. We know that there's all kinds of blood clots. Blood clots can form in the legs, they can go to the lungs, they can form inside the abdomen, especially with, uh, with certain diseases that are associated with the uh, abdominal organs. Uh, they can also form in the arms, particularly when, artif when lines are put in the arms uh, to, for drug infusion, but also uh, cerebral blood clots. Now we use the term strokes and, and I will ask Dr. Brodan to uh, not only discuss uh, the different types of strokes very briefly, but also this special issue we've seen a lot of in the news is cerebral sinus thrombosis. So it's a great pleasure to have you with us today, uh, Dr. Prodan, and uh, we look forward to your remarks. Thank you, thank you. So with, uh, with uh, COVID in general as a disease to see, we have seen an emerging uh, field of reports about, about clots. Uh, now I'm a neurologist, so uh, I will naturally focus on clots that involve the brain, but as you know, there are clots in COVID that involve a lot of other organs, P involving the lungs, uh, kidneys, and so far. For brain specifically, we've seen reports that uh, indicate that uh, they're clots that lead to strokes, clots involving large vessels in the neck or smaller vessels in the brain, uh, sometimes strokes that uh, are part of a hemorrhage, in other words, a, a bleed inside a brain because of vessel ruptures. And more recently, uh, there's been reports associated with COVID vaccine looking at an entity called cerebral venous thrombosis, which are clots that are inside the venous system, inside the vessels, uh, that are slow flow, lower, lower volume, slow, slower flow in the brain. Um, these are um, rare conditions that happen in the general population, but all these, all these entities have been described in, in COVID. Well, thank you very much. Um, that was very informative. Now, I've been told that uh, a lightning strike will affect about one person per million during their lives. And I would like to tell, I would like you to tell us based on your experience, how does that compare with the number of people that get a vaccine and the chances of them developing a thrombosis with that, uh, from the vaccine? Well, I think that's actually an excellent comparison. If you look at the uh, number of cases that uh, were reported uh, a few days ago, um, look, that prompted the, uh, uh, the hold or the temporary pause for the Johnson Johnson vaccine. We're looking at about six cases, six individuals, uh, and there may be um, up to 50 um, in, in, in Europe with uh, a different type of vaccine. So if you look at a number of patients that actually received the actual Johnson Johnson, which is in the order of millions, I think we're right, we're close to the uh, likelihood of being hit by lightning strike over lifetime, I want to emphasize this is over lifetime. So the number is, it's extremely close. The actual number of uh, uh, people that develop cerebral venous thrombosis in the general population, this is separate of COVID, is way higher than that. Well, thank you very much. So the, uh, the next question I would have is, uh, am I, am I uh, uh, um, are, are these blood clots common? Uh, what about in the general population? You know, we have uh, all sorts of uh, uh, people that develop blood clots. Suppose you get COVID-19. What is your, what, I, I have uh, seen figures that up to 20 to 25% of people will get a clot. And uh, uh, more than that, some of those patients will be very severely uh, affected Sometime they'll even lose a limb or part of a limb. There's a lot of problems associated with COVID-19 infection that is symptomatic and associated with blood clots. 
And what has been your experience in this regard? It is a common problem. And actually, um, if one looks at reports uh, from uh, probably some of the earliest reports coming out from Europe, we realized that the severe massive block clots that happen in the lungs and which could be potentially deadly are happening in a very large percentage of these people. I think 20% is what I see here, 10 to 20%, but in the people that are very sick, they, those are people admitted to the intensive care unit. We may be looking at much, much, much higher numbers of patients with COVID that develop clot related problems. Uh, of course, the number in the general population, it's lower than that. And that's because with COVID, uh, people have a tendency to have more often clots. Now, comparing those numbers with the minuscule numbers of one in a million chance of having a, a clot, such as CVT, after the vaccine, it clearly, in my opinion, the balance uh, between risks and benefits is clearly tilted towards the benefits. You, you're looking at a huge benefit from preventing preventing this condition. And I want to take just one minute, uh, Professor Caprini, and just go to one more one more point here. The number of people that develop blood clots with COVID, it's probably underestimated. And because really these individuals that become admitted to the hospital are extremely sick, they're extremely sick, they require ventilatory support, they're unstable. So the number of tests or the type of test that we can do with every single patient to find these clots may be limited. In other words, I think we're catching this, a smaller number of people with COVID that develop blood clots than actually they are in reality, which makes the case for preventing, for doing something to prevent this condition, in my opinion, even stronger. Well, thank you very much. And I would like to add to that, that approximately one out of eight people that survived this infection and go home are still at very high risk. They have shortness of breath, they're weak, they can't eat properly, they have neur neurology symptoms of various kinds. So this is a really serious disease. And I think the punchline from all of us is, for God's sake, go get the vaccine. Get it Absolutely. as soon as you can. Absolutely. Now we have with us uh, Dr. Hassan Sadaldin, who's a, a doctor in training. and. Uh, uh, I would like to have uh, you, uh, Hassan, uh, share your views with us about uh, how you young people and especially young physicians feel about uh, the vaccine and, and these problems. So for me, I think um, I have no doubt I'll get the vaccine as soon as my turn comes and as soon as I start my rotations. But I also want to ask about those friends of mine that say, and younger people say that I want to wait. I want to wait until everybody gets the vaccine. I don't feel um, confident about getting the vaccine because of complications. What What's your message to those younger guys that are not well informed? They watch the news, they see all this chaos, and they now they have more fear of actually getting the vaccine. Probably the best thing to do is to stop watching the news because we've just outlined to you, and, and I have a YouTube site and and all sorts of ways you can get a hold of me. We'll give you actual data. And, and as, as Dr. Prodan says, it's very, very rare. Six, 10 cases out of 6 million, 10 million, 20 million, compared to 20 to 25% of people that get, a, that get the vaccine. And um, I mean, that, that get the COVID-19 infection. So it's very, very important for you to get vaccinated vaccinated early. And if you have reactions to the vaccine, that means you're developing good immunology. You can't get the disease from the vaccine because there's no dead virus in there. It's a totally different mechanism. So I would encourage everybody to go out and, and get their vaccines. And, uh, you know, uh, the other thing is that uh, one needs to make sure that you uh, find out that uh, about your own risk and what your risks are in the general population before you get sick. And then that, that would mean for those people that are high risk, that may, would make it even more mandatory that they get the vaccine and get it, uh, get it soon. So I'd like to thank you uh, both for your contribution and um, uh, please stay tuned for more information uh, to our uh, YouTube channel and we'll try to bring you the latest and best data that we can. Thank you very much. And, uh, Thank you, Dr. Prodan, and thank you, Dr. Sedalvin, and uh, everyone, have a nice day.